Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so we're here to discuss uh, this book, Race and Modern Architecture, edited by Irene Chang, Charles L. Davis II, and Mabel O. Wilson. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, make some introductory remarks and then try and give you a flavour of uh, what's in the book, because I think kind of some of the idea behind the kind of event is that the book is quite sort of foregrounded. And then um, it's going to be opened up to our incredible panel, which consists of uh, Mary Vaughan Johnson, who's the head of architecture at Kingston, uh, Nana Biama Fosu, who's my colleague at Kingston, and uh, an architect at uh, Kurosevich Carson, uh, Shumi Bose, who teaches at Central St. Martins, uh, Victoria Koye, who's a postdoctoral uh, student at the University of Sheffield and uh, the historian, uh, Neil uh, uh, Shussell. So, right. Uh, first, I, I thought it would be important to um, talk about the weight of it, really. I mean, it's, it's a kind of, it's a weighty book, 18, 18 um, essays uh, spread over six parts, six chapters. Uh, and, and it's kind of, to describe it to you, it's kind of, if you, if those of who are in the kind of academic fraternity, they kind of know those, those Routledge books, which uh, are published after sort of big conferences where there are sort of professor after professor is kind of um, uh, written a, a kind of really dense text. So that, that's what this book is like. So I've been looking at it since the summer and I haven't read all of it yet. Um, I've read most of it, but not all of it. And the book is like, yeah, you know, it's hardback, it's heavy paper, it's really heavy. And I'm feeling the weight of expectation today. So. Um, some words about the, the, the nature of the endeavour at hand. Uh, and by that I'm talking about the book as well as this event, which are kind of the mission and the, and the scope is sort of closely aligned. So one often sees with, the, with these events, uh, which are kind of de rigueur at the moment in, this, in these times of COVID, COVID uh, pandemic, is sort of a freedom and a letting down of hair as architectural practitioners, scholars and educators unwind at the end of a long working day by partaking in extended and meandering conversations, which are fun because we might not know where we'll, we'll end up and that's when we really learn, right? Um, but I have the feeling of being somewhat, maybe not on trial, but uh, under cross-examination with this book, um, being a member of a constituency that has consistently highlighted the inconsequential space that has traditionally been allotted to our such subjectivities, those of peoples of color for so long, only to now have them placed front and center. I'm somewhat daunted and almost debilitated by the prospect of failure, uh, by the fear that this subjectivity won't come across as real. What makes this even worse is that we now have the perfect tool, uh, if you will, the book, although it's clearly much more than that. It's quite an experience to learn everything and nothing at the same time. Reading this book has confirmed and affirmed so much of what I have felt throughout my life as a black architect, and I include my time as a student in that, but have never really been equipped to express, even to myself. I've read and loved Frampton, Arendt, uh, Rossi, Tefuri, Cacciari, Los, and felt a, a real kinship with those thinkers. But there has always been another side, a shadow side of my life as a black architect, which has never really seen the light of day until relatively recently. And my PhD, I, I suppose, is really about introducing this shadow side to the part of me that has traditionally uh, been deemed more acceptable, even if that's never really been from me or those who have a passing resemblance to me. My studies have also recently had me wondering whether these thinkers who I admire so much would feel a reciprocal kinship with me. As a practitioner and now educator, I'm always reminded of a saying, uh, the origin of which I can't quite remember, to the effect that the making of art requires the ability to contemplate destiny. I interpret this as incorporating, for example, the wherewithal to look out and survey, to occupy hinterlands, to breathe in, uh, for reasons that may or may not become clear during this session, uh, that fear of failure again. Uh, the ability to contemplate destiny is perhaps the one thing that I feel that has been denied to me as a black architect. I'm always in survival mode, having to tread water in order to constantly reaffirm the value of my humanity, where white colleagues and peers need only to stand on solid ground. 
having to deny my subjectivity while that of white colleagues and peers is treated as objectivity. So on to the book. Um, I've picked out some choice quotes from about four or five sections of the book just to give you a flavor of what's in there. And I've got a couple of um, comments as well. And they are kind of um, chapters that have kind of resonated with me for different reasons. And I think you'll find that all of us have found parts of the book that resonate with us differently. Uh, so the first introduction, which is sort of jointly written by uh, Chen Wilson and Davis. Uh, so I quote, European colonial expansion and the subsequent development of racial slavery, mercantilism and industrial capitalism depended indispensably on the creation of ideologies of human difference and inequality. Walter Mignola has described coloniality as the reverse and unavoidable side of modernity, its darker side. Like that part of the moon we do not see when we observe it from the earth. Thus, to understand architecture's role within the glo global uh, modernity requires not just the incorporating objects, buildings and designers from an expanded geographical range, but also with grappling, but also grappling with the constitutive importance of race. It requires uncovering how colonial violence and slavery were inextricably linked with the cultural narratives and forms embodying reason and progress. I mean, this quote expresses one of those many things that I both learned from the book and already knew. Where the passage talks um, about ideologies of human difference and equality, I, I read personally, um, you know, this question about what is and what isn't culture and who is and who isn't a human being. Uh, another quote, to write a critical history of race in modern architecture requires several transformations in architectural historical uh, mythology, methodology, as well as institutional practice. First and most obviously, historians must expand the range of figures and objects we study to include the work of non-white subjects, including peoples previously deemed outside history, whose records were seen as not worthy of preservation. This requires consulting a wider range of archives and being inventive about what can constitute historical evidence. We must go beyond the architect's archives or buildings. But as we suggest above, the task is not merely to enlarge the canon, but to also question and make visible how race affects the institutional processes of historical collection, valorization, and narrativization. Another quote, Theorists like Darrell Fields have incorporated methods drawn from literary deconstruction and critical race studies to uncover the racial logics behind Hegelian universal theory, postmodern aesthetics, as well as a racial model of dialectics fundamental to architectural discourse. Uh, these these uh, two passages that I've just read, they, they kind of relate really to my, directly to my experience as a kind of fledgling scholar. Um, aspects of my proposed PhD have been difficult for me to communicate to others. For example, uh, so what does Ralph Ellison in 1940s New York have to do with Josephine Baker in uh, 1920s avant-garde Paris? And the connection has to do with uh, black subjectivity, uh, but in today's world, it's been a hard sell. Uh, partly because it's a difficult argument to make from within a semiotic and linguistic structure whose foundation is whiteness. As we shall see, this is more about uh, ancient Greeks and ancient Romans than it is about skin color. It's the dark side of the moon. It's this kind of insight, it's this kind of um, drawing out of, of, um, alternative, of an alternative vision uh, that is so alien to, to this world as it is subtended by the poles of blackness and whiteness and thus uh, so condemned to struggle for life in the atmosphere designed to snuff out that kind of insight uh, that is shot through this collection of essays. And that for me is the importance of the book. Uh, now on to sort of the body of the book, the first um, uh, part, uh, Race and Enlightenment. And there's a really great essay by Peter Menosch uh, entitled American Architecture in the Black Atlantic. And he's talking about um, William Thornton's design, uh, 19th century, 18th, 19th century design for the uh, United States Capitol in Washington, DC. This design brings together two distinct chateau typologies, a certain star salon, 
projecting east into the garden to evoke the feudal country estate and the compact single story block of the Western elevation, recalling the urban typology of the Parisian hotel. An examination of the two faces of the capital represents a similar series of dialectical oppositions. L'enfance, cosmopolitan urbanism and Jefferson's uh, agrarian ideology, southern informal markets and northern finance capital, slavery and free labor. While these seem to be at odds, a look at the commodification of enslaved people within uh, American chattel slavery shows them to represent the two components of a contiguous system of wealth production. Uh, this this passage is for me is one of those kind of you know this moments from Twitter speak, straight from the dark side of the moon or or from the slums of Shaolin, as it were. I'm the only person here that gets that reference, but maybe. Um, as black people, people of color, is often demanded that we choose between these two things in different guises. In addition, the investment that makes architectural production possible the wherewithal to survey and inhale is directly drawn from this contiguous system of wealth production. Uh, this reminds me of, a, of an article recently published in Architecture Today on the legacy of Kenneth Frampton written by uh, Professor Mary McLeod uh, from Columbia University. Uh, um, and it was 18, it was Architecture Today that, that commissioned me to write the, um, uh, the uh, review of this book. Um, so she, she quotes Frampton, quoting another architect who, who's familiar with working in America, Michael Glickman. And, he's, and Michael Glickman says to Fran Frampton, you have to understand, in England, the claws are hidden, but in, states, in the States, they are visible. In other words, the brutality and pervasive power of capitalism and the military industrial state were blatantly visible in the States. Trump and Biden, Johnson and Starmer, I would suggest it's really a debilitating non-choice, especially for people of color or those at the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid scheme that is the contiguous uh, system of wealth production mentioned above. Uh, in the same section, uh, there's a great essay by Reinhold uh, Martin uh, called Drawing the Color Line, which is about uh, the dumb waiter in Jefferson's country mansion. I quote, if in 1900, Du Bois prophesized that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. By 1800, when Monticello was well under construction, Monticello is Jefferson's uh, country estate. Uh, Rosie, could we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> it's just a picture of it there. That's it, that's the country estate. And we can already, uh, <clears throat> when, when Monticello is well under construction, we can already see that line being drawn, not by Mumford, not, not by what Mumford regarded as the civilizational anachronism of slavery, but by the mechanization of silence and the universality that he mistook as an incomplete avatar of modernity. This was the function of civilization in techniques and civilization, to convert the technologically and environmentally born particular into the universal. If we can have the next slide, uh, then we can see like a plan uh, of the, uh, of the fireplace with the dumb waiter, which was designed to sort of allow slaves to uh, serve their masters while they were talking and, and having dinner conversations without overhearing them. And the next slide just shows a, a kind of photograph of that, of that mantelpiece. For the relevant dialectic was not only one of master and slave, but one of silence and voice. Like slavery itself, the line underwrote the contradictory alliance of reason and capital that preoccupied Horkheimer, uh, and Adorn, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno and to Fury after them, if only because it so easily slipped out of sight for those moderns who, from Jefferson to Mumford, found it difficult to see the colour of their own skin. Uh, there's so much in that, in this, uh, in this particular quote for me. Um, number one, the institutional blindness to the constitutional role race has played in the making of modernity, uh, that anachronism comment from, from Mumford. Number two, Monticello, the um, Jefferson's country uh, um, villa, as a literal de depiction of structural racism. We talk of active and passive energy efficiency measures in architecture and design, but we can also speak of this in terms of racism. And the dumb waiter was a very active uh, uh, you know, depiction of that. 
William Thornton's realization that once the capital he designed was complete, he needed to get these Negroes out of here, uh, was arguably passive. Number three, the inability to see whiteness uh, that's mentioned in the article is something that Mabel O. Wilson in particular consistently calls attention to. It's the sin of the progressive who tells the black man that Marx is all he needs to know. And, and this is exactly the thing that Ellison, Ralph Ellison was railing against in the forties. Uh, the fourthly on the contradictory alliance between reason and capital, Horkheimer, Adorno and Tafuri. Uh, I'm reminded again uh, of the McLeod essay in uh, Architecture Today. She writes that for progressive architects, there are two paths. And I quote, that of Hamer, uh, Habermas and Gramsci who emphasize culture's potential as a constructive force countering prevailing ideologies, and that of Tafuri and Adorno, who seem to accept a darker, more totalizing view of, of capitalism's power. The question of whose culture becomes moot when culture is universal and transcendent, and race only exists when people of color annoyingly bring it up. I thought it was notable that Although Adorno and Tafuri are mentioned in this book, in this, in this essay, in fact, uh, Habermas and Gramsci, along with the assertion of, a transcend, of transcendent culture's capacity to act as a progressive force is absent, completely absent from the book. That inability to contemplate destiny again. In fact, I think that one of the lessons from the book is to ask the question whether any of us should be contemplating destiny. Personally, from the black point of view, capitalism does indeed seem dark and totalizing. And therein lies much of the attraction of the Fury et al for me personally. Neither Keir Starmer nor Joe Biden are any kind of our answer. It's not a question of brutalism or traditionalism. Just the stakes are, are far too high for such games. And this next essay, it kind of gets into what I call um, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency to talk about the kind of halfway point between whiteness and blackness as brownness, but I, I don't, I'm kind of get growing cold to that idea because it can't, it's too equated with skin color, which I think is kind of a, a kind of an irrelevant thing. I, I, I'm, I'm coining the term grayness today, grayness, gray subjectivity. This, this is an essay about, about China, which I was really struck by. Uh, it's by Addison Godel uh, called From Terrestrial Paradise to Dreary Waste. And it's about the fabled uh, 18th century Chinese garden, Yuan Ming Yuan, which uh, translates, roughly translates as gardens of perfect brightness. In 1712, largely on the basis of having discovered gardens such as this, uh, architects, uh, European architects such as Fischer von Erlach can, uh, you know, considered China to be an advanced civilization uh, on an equal footing with Europe. By the 1740s, uh, William Chambers, for William Chambers, the English architect, uh, the Chinese are great and wise, yes, but only in comparison to the nations that uh, are in their area of the world. By 1772, Chambers again, the Chinese garden that was once a symbol of civilization for Vodernak becomes uh, a, a, a symbol of covetousness, uh, uh, insatiable desire, decadence, and effemin effeminence. And that's directly related to basically uh, the West desire to get Chinese resources. So they made up uh, a kind of justification for themselves to um, dominate the country and um, wreak havoc on it, which they did in 1860 during two days towards the end of the open, uh, Opium War. British and French troops raised the garden to the ground. And I quote, China became a site of bodily thrills and earthly delights, not a universal reason even as it was placed hierarchically beneath Europe in its development, Chambers still equivocates on Chinese subjectivity and intelligence, but the stage is set for China to fully occupy the materialized, racialized exteriority that scholar Denise Ferreira de Silva has recently posited as co-constitutive of European transcendental subjectivity. I felt here a link to today's uh, Western foreign policy driven by the need uh, that hyper-capitalism has uh, to just um, steal other countries' resources and justifying itself in terms of democracy and other paternalistic overtures to childish nations. 
And even in, even in patern uh, even when the paternalistic initiatives seem on the surface intended to help these childish nations, as if their misfortune was natural, uh, was as natural as the changing of the seasons, uh, but which are often in truth about curbing non-white agency. And finally, um, linked to this militaristic uh, conception of cultural value, we have Charles Davis II in his essay on the in, in the next part of the book, Race and Organicism. Uh, he writes on, uh, uh, the next slide please, yeah, this, this is the one. Uh, he writes on uh, Henry Van Brunt and white, set, white settler colonialism in the Midwest, writing on the Darwinian conception of architectural development popularized in the 19th century America by figures uh, by, uh, such as Van Brunt, who was a Beaux-Arts trained architect. And um, he is quoted by Davis as saying, like all other experiments in the evolution of forms, only the fittest remain. Linked to this, Davis cites Berger's book, Sight Unseen, Whiteness and American Visual Culture. The aesthetic practices of white cultural elites were an, were an important indicator of what made them different and therefore worthy of leading the country. If you map this idea onto the culture of the typical school of architecture, UK or US, it tells you very clearly why people, why black people and people of color are unrepresented in the profession. We have to dispense with the idea that black misfortune and lack of black progress are naturally occurring phenomena. We have to recognize the damage that the uncritical deployment of the ancient Greece equals ancient Rome equals London equals insert European capital city of your choice equals valid architecture narrative does to architects of color and I include academics and students in that and ultimately to the profession of architecture itself. So with that, um, I will ask my fellow panelists if, if they have any, any reflections to make on, on what I've said or anything on the parts of the book that I haven't spoken about. Or if you haven't got anything, just tell us what, what made you come to the book. I'll start with you, Lana, since I can see you on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent introduction to the book. And for me, what brought me to the book and to answer that, um, I think it's a bit of what you said, Michael, this thing of um, feeling like you know something, but haven't quite articulated it yet, or knowing and not knowing at the same time. And for me, that's, I guess, um, what brought me to the book. And for me, the book, um, I was really excited to see it and to, to know that this has been written. <laughs> because for me, it's, it, it's, a, it's a permission for other works to, like this to be generated. Of course, the book has um, quite an, um, an American-centered narrative and most of the essays are talking about um, America and the US and that side of the globe. But I think what's, and actually, I, I don't think that it's, um, it's completely coincidental that that's where the book must start in the way that I think that um, as, as, as you also covered that in America, the claws are out and it's very evident how race um, has played um, a role in the shaping of the nation. And it's very much, there is no lack of that. Whereas perhaps in this side of the globe in Europe and the UK, the claws are hidden. So it's very hard to point to the things that you know and you mm -hmm. sense every day um, without them feeling like you're misinterpreting something yeah. or you are reading too much into something. And I guess for me, books like this really seminal work are, are, are a permission to kind of look and delve deeper into a kind of critical history of architecture that's always been devoid of talking about race. Like, you know, 400, and so years of chattel slavery didn't happen and how that has been the shapings and underpinnings of um, a European um, and American economic system, which definitely has ties then to architecture. Architecture is not realizing the void um, without economy and um, money. So then we have to start to ask questions about those, how those things are shaped or overall and their relationship to architecture. So for me, I think this, this book is really what I hope is the beginning of a long tradition of looking back at the kind of scholarly works um, in architecture and questioning the side that has never been talked about, which is race. And I think that I think that there's there's a lot of work to be done in kind of <laughs> rereading. Um, and I share the same thing about what you said about you know the writers that you find an affinity to. 
because I think they're excellent writers. They've produced excellent um, theory and ideas about architecture, but there is, there is a duty now to reread those with a critical lens about race and see what is missing. Because I think that that's how we all collectively um, move to a kind of place in our kind of discourse and profession that race can be acknowledged. It cannot be left to um, a particular group to form that interest. It needs to become the kind of le level playing that we all understand a critical meaning of what race means in architecture for us to really progress. And I say that in terms of academia, but as well as a profession, because if the profession cannot contemplate race, especially in a city like London, then we are failing 56% of the city's population. Yeah, uh, yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think there's a lot in what you said, actually. And, and um, uh, yeah, I could pick out any number of points and from criticality at the end. I mean, criticality is something that is discussed a lot. It's like a very fashionable word. And I've mentioned Frampton and he's responsible. But, but I think what you've kind of highlighted, Nana, is that um, unless we're talking about where the money comes from, which is a question of race, we're, we're not being critical. Mm -hmm. And I think this even relates to uh, one of the earlier talks in this week uh, to do with um, architectural unions, where um, uh, the historian, I've forgotten her name, but she, she the American uh, scholar, was talking about how uh, architects are kind of uncomfortable with with engaging politically. And I think this is kind of part of the same territory. But what you said, when you when you talked to me earlier on about this difference between uh, America, you emphasize the difference between America and, and the UK. I'm, I'm conscious that we've got two American architectural scholars with us. And I'm really interested to hear what, what first Victoria and then Mary uh, have to say ab about that and, and possibly anything else which which has grabbed them about, about the book. Yeah. So Victoria. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so thank you for having me. I think um, so many things to say, but I think, um, first of all, thank you for your introduction because I think um, it really lays out a lot of really important points and then Nana, what you also added. I think, you know, so it's, it's interesting, right? Because, um, so I'm doing my PhD actually in urban studies and planning, right? And working between um, architecture and urban studies and also geography. Um, and where to begin? So first I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm Nigerian American. I was born and raised in the US and, um, and I lived in Accra, Ghana for, a few, for several years. Um, but you know, today in the US actually is Thanksgiving, right? Uh, it's a Thanksgiving holiday, has this dominant narrative of like, this is this beautiful moment when the white settlers, European settlers and the natives came together and they had a beautiful meal together and the natives helped the white settlers, et cetera, et cetera. But it's actually a very violent history, right? And, mm. you know, I think as I was reading many of the articles, it, it, it comes out, but I think um, one of the challenges that we have um, when we're talking especially about uh, what we call the US, right? Is the entanglement, like that colonization was first of all a very violent process and that there was this, um, you know, genocide, displacement, dispossession of natives, right? And, mm -hmm. and it was upon this dispossession that the United States is built, right? So when we're talking about the Monticello and we're talking about all of these structures, it's, it's these two things always working together, right? It's the, the chattel slavery through which so many Africans were brought. It's also the dispossession of natives, right? That is the architectural history. Um, that's the foundation of the architectural history of the US, right? So always for me, it's about how to think about these things together. Um, and I think some of the articles, I think Charles Davis is, you know, really speaks to this in his, in his essay. Um, you know, the other thing that I think about is, you know, when we're, as, as someone who, again, is Nigerian American and studying here in the UK, I think a lot about how it's, it's, it's a relation, right? In the sense of like, literally the United States, <laughs> the, the, the colonies of the United States were English colonies, right? Um, and so I think we have to remember that the United States is an extension of a global imperialist project, right? Mm. That was not just in the US. The US was, the, it started out essentially, you know, kind of as plantations and selling, sending, you know, the unwanted people, that sort of thing. But just as like Jamaica and all these other places were plantation colonies, right? And mm. 
places like, you know, in West Africa and throughout where this is all part of the transatlantic slave trade, right? So yeah. for me, I'm always thinking about, and I know we, we had a conversation last week where I mentioned this about how are we always trying to think about these things in relationship with one another, right? Because what, what I really appreciated in this book is, and it comes out in several articles, is about these, these connections, these mobilities, um, these relations between people who were, you know, someone who was born in, you know, like a white settler who was born in, you know, Kenya, a white mm. settler who was born in the West Indies and is galvanizing money through this plantation economy in order to do all of these things, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's like, even before we begin to talk about the buildings, we have to talk about the terra nullius. Do you know what I mean? We have mm -hmm. to recognize this, that like, and because this is the blueprint that we see throughout, if we're talking about colonial experiences, like throughout, right? Like this is what was done, not just in the US, but also in parts of Jamaica and parts of Barbados and parts of mm. what we call Nigeria and parts of Ghana, et cetera. You know, it was this process of not recognizing mm existing ways of being, building, existing, and displacing and dispossessing that, destroying that, and then trying to build what, like a universal model on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. No, no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I think maybe now's a good time for, for Mary to come in because you, you mentioned, you've mentioned Africa, uh, and uh, Mary has a link to Africa as well, has a link to the States and a link to uh, <laughs> this country and yeah what, what, what can you add <laughs> yeah thank you thank you michael and and thank you uh, architecture foundation for this opportunity uh and i feel quite privileged to be on this panel so i just wanted to to say that before um in answer to your first question michael about how i came to the book um or maybe I should say something about where I come from since you mentioned Africa I was born and raised in uh in Zimbabwe and uh, moved to the States for university, so at the age of 17. And you can imagine culture shock and all of that. In fact, my PhD is on toilets, which really kind of came about uh, with my interest in private and public spheres in architecture, because in the culture where I was raised, the public and the community took precedence over the individual. When I went to the US, this was flipped. The individual took precedence and that comes from transcendentalism, by the way, which is also a whole another thing. But um, with that, when we talk about private and public spheres in architecture, I was always kind of lost. It didn't resonate with me and I struggled with it. And so that's why toilets, looking at these concepts, I won't go further into that. But how I came to the book is I've met actually Mabel Wilson on a number of occasions and uh, was aware that the book was coming, so it was quite anticipating the book. Um, and I, I was thrilled. Uh, I really have enjoyed looking at it. And it's helped me, in fact, uh, just this um, last week, this week, I revised the lecture that I give to my first year students on the interwar years, which is my period, my research. And I've revised it to include some of the readings from this book um, and felt really uh, refreshed with it a whole different lens uh, on what I've been talking about for quite a number of years now. So I think this is the beauty of this book is that it's, it's challenging us. It's challenging us as scholars and uh, people in the discipline of architecture to relook and, and, and understand the history as in fact stories. And that's sort of the next thing I wanted to talk about is part of the problem we have in architectural education is that we've forgotten the meaning of the word history, which is really story. And of course, when you think of it as story, you realize there are many stories. And of course, to tell stories is to remember. So it has to do with memory. And when we think of memory in ancient world, mnemo the, uh, mnemonic devices were ways related to the art of memory. And for the Greeks and the Romans, they understood that there were two types of memory. There was the natural memory, and then there's the artificial memory. The natural is the one that we experience, the one that is, is um, more um, informal. I guess it's the way you experience it, how you remember it. Whereas the other one is educated. It's the artificial, it's the one you're taught. And the problem with architectural education is that we're remaining in the taught part of it. 
which has more to do with the discipline of architecture, which of course has always been dominated by white male, when you go back into history. And, and a good example of that, just wanna give a quick analogy of what I'm really saying in terms of architecture is when we look at medical history versus the history of medicine, when a doctor is asking a patient for medical history, it's about your life, it's about your healthy health life. Or your, your. But when we talk about the history of medicine, we're talking about the discipline. So in architecture, when we say the history of architecture, it's the discipline. But if we're gonna say architectural history, then we're talking about the life of the buildings. When you start to talk about the life of the buildings, you're starting to now talk about the context of the culture, the builders, the owners. Now you're going into the realm of the kind of memory and the stories, which is this what this book is addressing that's been missing in architectural education. And I think it's so critical uh, that we revise this history that we've been telling and, and giving in architectural history to bring in the true stories of, of architecture that have more to do with the natural memory rather than the artificial. Thanks for that, Mary. That was uh, really, really interesting. It actually reminded me that, um, that Professor Wilson, uh, she, when I, heard, I saw her uh, take part in a seminar about the book in, over the summer, and she actually raised the question, and I think it's related to the point that you make, that mm -hmm. whether we should be talking about history of architecture, we should be talking about history of building, Exactly. Um, because architecture is, well, you could argue it is a, a Eurocentric white male creation. It doesn't right. have anything to do with a lot of us. Um, yeah. Interesting, uh, uh, I mean, the segues are just being laid out for me because you mentioned interwar and we have, uh, and history and the nature of history, and we have a historian whose Twitter handle is interwar. So Neil. Uh, <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Sadly. And if somebody could tell me how to change that, I'd be hugely grateful. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think that um, I think that that what you and Mary have just been discussing is is right. This is this is about epistemes um, mm -hmm. and the intersection of of the epistemes of architecture, the discipline of architecture, and the discipline of architectural history. And it does seem to me that, that one question that, that this, this book uh, implicitly raises and which we, you know, which we might take forward is, why do we want architecture? And why do we want architectural history? Uh, it's a busted flush. I mean, I, I, and I think there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a real case to be, to be made for that. Uh, we need a built environment and we might need stories and memories of those, but I'm not sure, as you say, that the uh, profession of architecture and the discipline of architectural history are necessarily fit for purpose. So why do I say that? And, and, and maybe I can answer that by reflecting on your initial prompt, which was how I came to this book, um, which I suppose was partly as a result of uh, some things I've been trying to do uh, with institutions. Uh, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, I, find, I, I sort of find myself uh, a strange product of um, pedagogical and cultural strategies of occlusion, <laughs> um, to, put it, to put it pretentiously. But, you know, I, I feel that, uh, and I'm interested in, 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 in how it came to be that, uh, despite my mixed heritage, half Nigerian, half uh, Ugandan Gujarati, that uh, I have spent the last decade working on this peculiar profession of white middle-aged men in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> to, to, to me, I mean, to me, that's, that has always been partly about race. And I felt that my second generation immigrant perspective necessarily permeated that perspective, uh, permeated the, the writing of that history. And, and what I realized and what I've, I've realized in, in more and more imminently in particular this year is that not everybody else <laughs> was seeing it that way. 
um, um, and uh, that there were ways in which I had appeared to be uh, non-threatening um, in certain contexts, and I, you know, I find that deeply uncomfortable, and it was never, uh, it's never, as it were, it was never my intention, and so having tried to, uh, through a number of institutions I'm involved in, within uh, architectural history and education and within um, heritage and conservation practice, tried to initiate conversations about race, about equality, diversity, inclusion, about legacies of colonialism and empire, um, heard very little back except the dog whistle. Mm. And um, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> and, I guess, and I guess, I guess that, um, and I guess it does speak to um, uh, a degree of privilege, and as I say, a, a sort of projection of of, of non-threat um, that I'd never heard it quite so clearly before. And that's I find right. that, that, that what's exciting about the the um, arguments contained in the book is that, you know, again, it, it adds an urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, it provides, it bolsters arguments uh, to take into those contexts in order to uh, affect change, let alone what it does to one's own uh, uh, research and thinking. The first, uh, it's the first brick, literally, brick um, in, in, the, in the new edifice that we have to Build, which isn't going to be called architecture um <laughs> uh, and uh yeah I, yeah i think uh what you said at the end there about about uh, the dog whistle and about nothing coming back i mean that was kind you kind of um you've kind of uh, almost repeated what i said at the beginning about my fear about this event is that is the kind of subjectivity does won't come across because it's because everything's conditioned to snuff it out, you know. So there are so many ways in, in, in within the power structures that we live and work in for for our voices to to not be heard. And we've been experiencing that all, all our careers. But epistemies, epistemies, I think this is the perfect time to move on to Shumi, who's uh, a teacher, uh, uh, an educator at Central St. Martins, and is also of uh, Indian heritage like, like uh, uh, Neil. So I think that mm -hmm. just to get your view on, on the questions that have been raised. Yeah, uh, God, there's so many, so many great things been said. I've just been having such a nice time listening to you all. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you also AF for putting on this event and for inclusion on the panel. Um, it's been such an intense year to think about all of these things. Um, this book was published pretty much exactly a year ago. I think it was in November 2019, although kind of um, perhaps came to prominence um, after the murder of George Floyd this summer. So um, it's been quite a year for this, quite a kind of year of context for this book to kind of have emerged onto the scene. It would have, would have hopefully had this much impact any time, but it has actually you know, seemed to crunch a few things together. So my experience of coming to this book, reading it and so on has been extremely intense, uh, one that I've experienced in some degree of isolation, which in, in some way is a bit of a blessing because there's a lot to chew through in this book. As Michael said at the beginning, it's heavy, it's academically written. You need to read a couple of, I mean, forgive me, I think with my 350 students in my head all the time. So I'm reading sentences thinking, how many times would I have to read this over out loud? How many times would my students have to? And actually I came to the book uh, Hang on, uh, let me organize what I'm going to say. Coming, following from what Neil was saying about, um, and Michael, about let's say that funny feeling when you know you're talking about something important, but you kind of also know it's not going to land on particularly fertile or sympathetic ground. Um, I must say, I think I've done that to some extent myself. I, I don't know about the rest of you guys or anybody listening. Um, certainly when I was studying um, my third year project, I really wanted to base in favelas in Rio. And my parents said, no, you can't go to Rio, you'll get shot. And so you must go to the slums in India instead, because that's way safer. Um, <laughs> and I, 
no guns, but I'm a girl. Um, so, uh, and I really didn't want to. I really didn't want to be an Indian student doing a project about certain situations in India. I kind of felt like I'd be, I was being forced to wave a flag that I didn't want to feel like I was, you know, if there had been so many events around race and architecture and someone had been saying to me when I was a student, you should go to these, I would have said, fuck off. I want to go to the events that everybody's going to. Why are you trying to ghettoize my education? Um, so I think there's a certain amount of uh, liberation that I've granted myself this year um, and in recent years. Um, so while I'm grateful for the book, uh, and the kind of climate that allows me to discuss it, I also have to kind of acknowledge that some of those things are in ourselves. I also ought to mention that um, I've been trying to work quite hard using this book, but also generally, again, to, to address my students and to kind of be talking with them. Um, I know lots of colleges addressed or didn't address um, the kind of wave of Black Lives Matter movement that's surged this year to a greater or lesser extent, but I've been trying to relate to my students and as such realizing that I have a different experience, I think to most of the people here because I grew up in my majority. I was born in England, but I grew up in India. Um, I didn't come into architecture thinking this is a white man's profession. This is something that I've had to sort of <laughs> gradually realize to my slight confusion and you know, some sort of Damascene moment of like, oh yeah, looking around. But I didn't really, I didn't come to this country and have a higher education expecting to see myself. I was very aware that I was having my higher education in England. And so I fully expected everybody to look the way they look and not necessarily um, feel particular angst about that. Because I know where people look like me. I grew up there, there's loads of me. So there's a sort of different, um, let's say, uh, discomfort that I'm experiencing in coming to realize um, the frameworks in which we operate, the frameworks in which I work as a teacher, my syllabus, um, what I'm inflicting and imposing on my students, what discussions are possible, what discussions don't seem to be welcomed within the academy. And so I know I'm not talking directly about the book, but the book is such a wonderful um, prop and tool. Yeah to allow me to do that better. Mm. So just, sorry, quickly before I pass back, um, how I came to the book, uh, I used to live in New York. So um, all my colleagues, all my friends, my best friends from when I used to live in New York now do what I do. So they teach architecture at Columbia and all of these other um, institutions where Professor Wilson and the other authors teach. And so I'd been aware of the book. I bought, I bought it when it came out. And then all this happened this year. And one of my recent graduates um, got in touch with me and said, hey, I want to read this book, but I can't afford it. Um, what do I do? And I said, well, don't worry. And, and he was feeling um, unemployed at the time. He has a job now, unemployed at the time, but he was feeling a little bit lost in the world. And so we decided to do this, Zoom conversations where we met up. And uh, I... Um, for a while I was photographing and sending him photos of pages until they put it up on JSTOR and then he was able to read it because it was it came out at 60 pounds which put it outside of the bounds of um, many people. I don't resent the price of the book, research and publication costs money. I think there's a paperback out now which is a lot cheaper um, and I'm really glad that it was on JSTOR but um, when I read the book and how I really experienced the book this year was reading it with students and really going through it bit by bit, being able to acknowledge that a lot of this history and a lot of the perspective of the book is an Atlantic one and um, from the perspective of America. And what was really exciting about that experience was continuously going, oh my God, there's so much work left to do. Who's gonna write this? What about this story? Mm -hmm. And this continuously kind of, it's very difficult to actually get through the text of the book because we kept saying, my student is not here tonight, so I'm gonna embarrass him. Drell's small, you should find him on Instagram and embarrass him. <laughs> but um, Drell um, and I were reading it together and we spent about four to six hours on it. And so far we've gotten through the introduction and we've been contemplating the chapters to open up to a reading group. If you wanna join our reading group, get in touch. Um, but looking for, that was difficult, kind of looking for ways, um, I think Drell is of, uh, 
he's from Barbados, or at least his background is. So there are certain chapters that interest him. Personally, finding myself a uh, little bit starved in this book, because there's not that much in terms of the British Empire and its um, kind of impact. And so we were talking about, yeah, you know, there's Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy and wonderful scholars in sociology. Mm -hmm. And if I was to talk about literature, I could mention Hanif Qureshi and Salman Rushdie and a bunch of other people, but in architecture, not so much. So the book was illuminating in terms of what there is left to do. I think I'll stop there because that's the most exciting thing. That's that's great. That's really great, Just, um, Shumi. I think to Shumi's point there about the um, yeah the lack of kind of British perspectives in here. One of the essays I really did enjoy though was Mark Crinson's um, in 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 um, chapter five, which talks about um, the compartmentalized world, and really starts to articulate a kind of British position on um, race and colonialism which I think it, it does very powerfully because part of the reason why it's difficult maybe yet to write books like this is the kind of way the British role in um, the history of slavery has been positioned as kind of external. So there's this kind of triangle that goes around between the US, the Caribbean and Britain. And Britain gets to exclude itself from the kind of memory of slavery by kind of shifting um, its positions, but in, in Mike Crinton's essay, it becomes very evident this kind of compartmentalized world and what it does to um, to the Kenyan landscape and the way that, um, as Victoria was saying, it starts to link these kind of three territories together, and you can see the way that the Kenyan landscape is brutalized by race and the ideologies of race and the kind of Mike Crinton talks about. Um, he uses um, um, sorry. Makes up to my mind. Um, it's Kenyatta, isn't apologies. it? It's Kenyatta's book. Kenya, um, it's Kenyatta's book, but also yeah. um, he Google also Google. uses um, Fa um, um, Franz Fanon's um, essays mm. to kind of start to explore this notion of the comp compartmentalized way of being and what that then generates for the landscape. And I think for me, that was a really uh, great essay because it was one of the early ones that starts to touch on the kind of British role in all this and the kind of and also makes it evident that it's relational that that these things do not happen in isolation they're completely relational and yeah there's more work to be done in understanding that relation relationships between them because one of the things that perhaps makes this subjective is the comp compartmentalization of them the fact that we're able to compartmentalize this kind of um uh, episodes of uh racism and slavery means that we are able to make them subjective to one place and you know one time thing whereas if we start to think about them as a kind of impactful uh, events in world history that are completely linked i think we would have a harder time in england disregarding it it's it's interesting because mark crinson it, it seems to, to have been the only architectural historian who um uh, uh, took um, the new imperial history uh, of the 1990s uh, remotely seriously in a critical way. And, you know, again, perhaps it, it expresses the abject failure of the um, discipline of architectural history in the United Kingdom to uh, have engaged with these questions uh, in any sustained way at all. Um, I mean, that's changing. Uh, Jessica it Kelly is. here somewhere um, and is is producing a, a series of podcasts uh, for the Society of Architectural Historians with which I'm involved. The first of which, the first two of which I think are on architecture and empire and the third of which is on architecture and race. You know, it's interesting. Say also, it's extraordinary. I mean, it is, we should state the extraordinary fact that this is a majority uh, black uh, panel discussing architectural history. I mean that in in the United Kingdom, that in itself is 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 an extraordinarily belated occasion. Mm. And I think that's one of the striking things about the experience of the book is that you think, really, has there not been a book like this in the UK? We've had such a longer. I mean, as Victoria was saying, America or North America itself is a product of race and modern architecture. If we're taking modern from post enlightenment, then that is what it is, and we are handed that. I think uh, we have a remarkable capacity in this country to 
kind of move on from things in a quieter way than perhaps we ought to have done. So for instance, um, and this is my fault because I'm an architectural teacher, but my student hadn't really apprehended the Bannister Fletcher tree um, before this book. Yeah, let's talk about and, that tree. And, you know, we don't really talk about it because it's, it, it, I think somebody had it up on screen. We don't really talk about it anymore. We still talk about Bannister Fletcher, but we don't talk about the tree anymore. And, and there's so many bits in that book that are fascinating. I was asked by the RIBA to put together some decolonization Instagram things. And there's so much in there that we don't talk about. And so the, the sort of one of the great takeaways from the book, whether whether people invest in it or not, is um, just that reflection in a way and or the absence of it in the UK. Do we do the RIBA now as well with the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Ever ready. <laughs> Sorry, Victoria, you're gonna, you're I gonna think, come in. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about um, you know, earlier we were talking about epistemes, right? Epistemes. Epistemes, epistemology. Mm. That word. Mm -hmm. But um, I think for me it makes me think a lot about, you know, in the introduction, I think um the editors talk about sort of, you know, the importance of finding and using new tools to sort of excavate and understand the way that race has been operationalized and weaponized, um, et cetera. And so it includes things like, you know, like not just relying on, um, you know, architectural histories, not just looking at actual buildings. Like we actually have to expand the, the forms and the forms of knowledge that we're looking at, right? And so it makes me think a lot about, um, some of the, the conversations like in Accra, for example, on race and how mm -hmm. you aren't often going to find, let me rephrase this, that some of the most, um, personally, I found some of the most critical and engaging discussions about race are in film and mm -hmm. in popular, like different forms of popular culture, right? In yeah, literature, yeah. right? Um, and so, this is something that I really enjoyed in this book is all of the ways in which I think there's so, multiple examples in which the, the different authors are looking at various forms of material, right? Mm -hmm. and how that becomes really, really important. Um, it also makes me think about how, you know, as someone who my training has been through, you know, largely through um, urban studies and planning, like questions of race are not in terms of historically, right, are not mm -hmm. new, right? And so mm -hmm. it also makes me think about how during my doctoral research, like, you know, I was really, how do you say, it, it required me to really be engaging with like, okay, what are they saying in architecture about race? Where can I find people talking about race? Okay, where mm -hmm. in geography can I find people talking about race? Where in urban studies can I find people talking about race? And sort of, there's interesting confluences where I think, um, on the one hand, people are talking about the same thing, but I think the value is how people talk about it, right? Like I think it's right. in a Diane Harris article where she talks about the value or the power I think of architecture is that talking about race in, a, in site specific ways, looking at actual sites and then placing them within this historical relation, right? Mm. Um, in terms of the, this global project of racism and white supremacy. Contextualizing, contextualizing like yeah. correctly. Because I think there's a lot of obf obfuscation that's that goes on, kind of uh, witting or unwitting. Um, yeah, and and I, I think just connected to your point about planning, uh, which again, the discipline of architecture, at least in this country, they like to kind of say well, that you know that's something over there, and it's kind of not very, not very. We're not interested in that. It's not fashion, not sexy, which helps the obfuscation, right? So, uh, uh, but but I'm kind of thinking like in the one of the one of the essays in the book uh, on the black skyscraper by Adrienne Jones which is a really fantastic mm -hmm. essay, really fantastically written as well. Mm -hmm. And she makes this point that um, um, you can't understand the history of architecture, uh, the history of the built environment without understanding racial history. Mm -hmm. But you also can't understand the history of race without understanding the history of the built environment. And I, you know, I read that and it was like, you know, it's like a diamond bullet. <laughs> it, was, it was like, wow. It is the most obvious thing in the world, but that's mm -hmm. how difficult it is to unearth this type of this attitude to uh, to knowledge to to the epistemes. Um, just I want always to draw on what Shumi said about uh, 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 and Neil said about the kind of you know the lack of 
the lack of progress in this area as compared to this book. And I think you're right, Nana, that, that it had to come from America first, like everything else comes from America first in this regard. But I, I, I'm struck, uh, Mary, um, you've been trying to do things in, in your role as a head of school for quite some time, long before uh, uh, George Floyd was killed, mm -hmm. long before this summer. So I wonder if you want you want to say about uh, sure. something about about that uh, that question that Shumi raised. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot to do, I guess, with my own upbringing and my own sort of sense of place and belonging within the architectural profession, mm. which was always a struggle as a woman, first of all. But um, I think, you know, having been raised the way that I was, I, I was the only white person in my school for, ye for all of my primary and, and secondary school. I was the only white person besides my siblings. And my first language was the local dialect, you know, so I was always, always reminded of my privilege. I was always aware of it. Mm. And it, 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 it was something I struggled with because it meant, it meant I could never belong. Mm. So that sense of belonging has always been a struggle for me. And so I felt the same in architecture, that sense of belonging. And I was living in France for a while when I was um, invited to take a post at De Montfort. And when I visited De Montfort, I was blown away by the number of non-white students. And that really drew me. That was just like, this is where I feel I belong. And so I came there and then Kingston was the next step, uh, but it was for the same reason. Kingston has more than 50% non-white students entering in the first year. And so for me, that became kind of a mission to try to change. I was taught, uh, my mentor had a huge influence on me. When I, when I wanted to do a PhD, that concept of private and public was something that I thought I could investigate in looking at the Great Zimbabwe, right? Which, which mm -hmm. is a history of a building that existed way before colonization, but it was claimed, of course, by the white people and it was basically said there's no way that anyone else could have built it before. So that was something that really fascinated me because again, I'm coming from a culture where I understood that the collective was always so much more important than the individual. And so, you know, that, but then I realized with my professor that he was not tooled to help me with that subject. And there were no resources except those written by the colonizers on the subject. So, I thought more, it took me two years to come to toilets. <laughs> and I think toilets for me became the place, and I'm talking about specifically uh, private, the toilet in the home and the mm -hmm. mechanized toilet. So very tied to modernism, very tied to colonization, very yeah. tied to the universal ideas of standards, you know, universal standards. And, mm -hmm. and where I could, I could sort of see a, a, a tool that I could use to start to try to find humanity in architecture, that human dimension that I always felt was missing. So when I came as the head of department, yes, I, I you know, it was, it was an agenda. It, it, it always has been, like it's something that I have been working on. Uh, so it's not something that just came to light, but yeah, it was very much in my, and I'm, you know, I think the time that we're in now is so exciting. I think we're in a moment where we can't afford to turn back. I think it's a moment where we, we, you know, the, we, we've got to move forward with this and, and we have to keep working on it. And uh, yeah, no, that's, thanks for that. Question. Yeah. No, 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 that's, that's really great. That's really fantastic. Sorry, it was Neil, did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say that part of the problem certainly that I've, that I've experienced in relation to what you're suggesting, Mary, is that um, it still seems to be so threatening to people mm. uh, and, and, so, and so disruptive. And yeah. I, I do wonder about uh, how we can devise um, strategies which um, Make it make it appear less threatening. Make it yeah. Make make these conversations feel I, more positive. 
I, I think we have to understand, um, I, I'm really interested in my idea, but I'm also always questioning why it feels threatening. And I don't think that that is uh, the role of those that have been abused by a system to make themselves less threatening. I think that um, people that, that benefit from this being viewed as a threat should be asking the question, why does this feel threatening? And what is the investment in whiteness that makes this feel particularly threatening? And it seems like those are some of the questions we're yeah. trying to ask. I agree, Nana, and I think I think that any change, there's no comfort in it, right? So if, yeah. if yes. you're going to change, you have to accept it as something discomfort. that requires a discomfort, that yeah. requires a, a, a pain. It's a painful thing, you know. Yeah. It's a habit, something you you've become accustomed to, and something that you 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 don't know how you know how to do things differently. When you're being forced to change, and we're all experiencing it in the pandemic, how painful that, that process is. Mm, mm. And that's why I think this moment is so important because we've all understood that. We're all understanding collectively, globally, that change requires this kind of discomfort. We're, we're facing change, but we're in a, it's a very painful, painful process. And I think there's no way out of that. Mm. No, I, I, I'm, I'm all for pain. Yeah. And I'm all <laughs> uh, you can't see the rest of this room, but anyway, I think that. Um, I think that <laughs> but I think you could make threatening fun. I mean, it's, I, 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 I take your point, um, Nana, and, I, and I, I, I don't dispute it. And and and, uh, but I, I do think, for instance, around. I know we're veering a little away from the book, but but for instance, around. Um, uh, contested and difficult heritage, for instance, mm -hmm. um, the whole conversation becomes so uh, focused on that which is being removed rather than what we might build. Right. You see what, so, 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 exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So how you and how you might, pro I mean, it's partly, I think it is partly literally in some instances because of the nature of the planning system, <laughs> you know, the kind of the built, the built in antagonisms there. Mm. that you can't seem to productively say well what could not just this place but these places because of course place is defined by its connection to other places how could they be how could they be different and i i do i do think that again um the ways in which this book addresses uh, uh architectures um um mediation i guess Mm. Might, might point to some some ways in which uh, we do that, um, uh, uh, and in terms of the language, you know, in terms of the language that we uh, that we, we use. use. Yeah. And again, you know, I make the point that her neither heritage, uh, nor architecture, nor architectural history have had any serious conversation about the ways in which its fundamental practices are implicated in an imperial political economy. There was a that's pretty. Uh, I think that I agree with that. There's a the terminology. There was a, a lecture uh, that uh, Nana, you alerted me to at MIT uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on the architecture of the Sahel. And it was uh, Professor Okoye uh, talking about the architecture of the Sahel. And what the point he made was that you have these UNESCO World Heritage Sites uh, in, the, in and around the Sahara now. And they find these kind of um, uh, earthen, earthen buildings which they make architectural because they're now you, you UNESCO heritage, heritage sites they make them into architecture but to the people there they they, they understand them in a completely different way they understand them as uh, you know ashes to ashes dust to dust they understand these things as, as part of their biological existence as part of uh, I guess what Hannah Arendt would, would talk about as, as labor which is the kind of the things you do which are kind of far, farming uh, eating subsistence, yeah? So to them, it was completely nonsensical that you should come and you should preserve these things. Mm. But the UNESCO, you know, yeah, did that and they've done sort of damaging. I mean, one of the, I think they're actually referring to, um, to Niger when, when uh, he, was, he was talking about, he was talking about Niger and, the, and some of the UNESCO heritage sites in Niger. Yeah. Um, um, the other thing can that I, comes to mind from I, what you were sorry, saying. Sorry, Michael. Oh, yeah, go on. Okay. Just come back to um, 
not necessarily contents of the book, but the kind of prompts um, and mm. kind of experiences of reading it. Because where I left off speaking, I was sort of talking about how exciting it was. And I think that's, again, uh, Mary underlined that about, you know, what's an exciting time it is to be an architectural historian in some ways, um, because all of these avenues are now kind of not only open, but beckoning perhaps for the first time. Um, and then also kind of very much empathizing. I was just looking for um, one of the Instagram posts that I made for the RIBA, which showed the um, Bank of England with its roof off. Um, and I was looking at the Commonwealth room, which is just like such a fascinating thing to see this room in which the Commonwealth was financially processed, you know, really. Um, <laughs> and the comments underneath were quite hostile. What are you trying to say? This is getting really dangerous, it said underneath. Really? I think the post mm -hmm. has been deleted. I'm not sure. I can't find it. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, it happened anyway. And so I was thinking about, yeah, actually, maybe I can't um, let go of things at a position of optimism because there, there are these things, fears um, or kind of perceptions of transgression or perhaps something to be lost. And I was thinking as we were speaking, as I was listening to you guys about how one deals with this, I was thinking about how similar it was. Again, I'm sorry to be so kind of personal subjected about it. Well, we want to That's be sorry. Be about subject. Minute, so. Yes. Um, <laughs> carry, carry yeah, uh, I guess I was thinking these realizations that I have every time I read something that resonates of just like, man, how can it still be like this? And how can mm. I not, have, you know, how can I still be apologizing for my subjectivity and so on? It's a similar thing that um, I had with gender issues when I was about 25, mm -hmm. realizing that actually the feminist fights of the 60s and 70s didn't actually change anything. And because and, I kept thinking up until that point, but I thought all this was dealt with. I thought this was clear yeah. now. I thought, yeah. you know, and that, that kind of slightly heartbreaking realization. And I think one way to maybe approach this or how I'm thinking about making these sorts of issues not exclusive um, and inclusive is to kind of allow ourselves to acknowledge those things. It is heartbreaking to realize that things are so fucked up. Yeah. It is heartbreaking to realize that whether through effort or proximity, we are kind of conditioned to exist in this profession, in this academy, in this discourse in a particular way. And if that can be something that we can acknowledge in sharing, because I'm sure the discomfort is felt whether you are a subject of that oppression or whether you're mm. somehow by accident yeah. at birth. You know. What I wanted to what I wanted to to draw you on actually, Shimi, and I'm going to talk about myself as well, uh, was the student experience because because I think yeah we have we all have as kind of mature people in this in this profession we have we have reactions but um, I remember being a student um, at Sheffield actually um, and but I could have been anywhere. And thinking that just something is not right here, you know. Uh, I'm in the Arts Tower. I'm, I'm, I was the only black guy in the, on the course then, uh, in my year, um, which I expected because I was in the north of England. Um, but uh, I thought that I just don't, it doesn't fit. I don't fit in this place. And I, I couldn't figure out why. I didn't know why. And uh, what I did is I immediately, I immediately rebelled against my um, teachers because I'm I'm not the type of person to just do what the tutor says because he says I should do it so I never did that and I I tried to I tried to do stuff that would generate uh, a kind of discourse I didn't realize what I was doing but I mean my first dissertation was you know quoted quoted lyrics from hip-hop you know and I never would have done that if I didn't have that experience you know mm -hmm. um, I started listening to like really hardcore hip-hop music which I never did when I was in Croydon you know, so I'm wondering how your students have fared with with you read, with you reading the book with them. How mm. what's their what's been their reaction to to this? Um, I hope none of them are watching, but I love my students so much. <laughs> um, no, I do hope they're watching. Of course, I do. But um, really great. I think not necessarily. I mean, this book is particularly chewy. I teach mostly. Most of my students are um, undergraduate students, so. It's, heavy book for them yeah it, well i don't think anything's beyond anyone um i wouldn't want to mm. give anyone that impression but we take time 
um, to talk about, uh, to read it, and to read it not Everybody necessarily. Reads, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, maybe I'm just like, you know, forgetting. No, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone. Sorry, I have teacher hat on. I don't want to discourage yeah. anyone or make people feel that you can't read it because the words are big. I mean, look them up. You're on your computer anyway. So, <laughs> um, but I think we'll do that. And I think what's been, what's been, what I've felt the need to do and what I will do, I think even increasingly outside of my institutional roles. And I want to talk more to Neil about institutional roles and things like this, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a situation of creating space, creating space to have these discussions, to have yeah, these thoughts, yeah. creating spaces that are safe. Um, sometimes that means exclusive creating spaces that are very, very inclusive, where people don't have to feel guilty for not having this subjectivity or not necessarily mm. feeling like, am I allowed to talk about race? I'm white, what do I do? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a question of creating space. And I currently, I, I must say, I don't know in my institutional role if yeah. the academy provides for that space. I'm looking for ways to, I mean, it's very, it's a very good thing that I'm stuck at home because I'm just using every available hour to, that I can. I've been talking to students from Thailand, from India, from America, from a, a lot of places about this stuff. Yeah. But what I find yeah. is that there's a need for space. Um, right. In terms of, in, in, in what sense, in what yeah. sense do you, do you mean in terms of, um, there's, there, there's deliberately or there's, maybe not deliberately is not the right word, but because of the way that the epistemology of architecture is structured, we, it's very difficult to talk about some of these things. They seem, well, superfluous. They seem of... superfluous to the discipline. Is that what you're getting at or? or... It's, it's perhaps super, super, it has been superfluous to the profession and to yeah. the industry. I yeah. don't think that will hold for much longer. Um, so I think this space, while it might be extra institutional for now, it ought to be institutional soon, yeah. and it will be once it makes business sense. It will be. Yeah. That's the, that. that's the bit, isn't it? That's that's yeah. the uh, that's the watershed, isn't it? When it makes business sense, which because of the diversity of the uh, society we live in, mm. and uh, the diversity of our cohorts yeah. is kind of coming and I think this is maybe I, mean, I don't I can hear you talking and I don't know if you want to talk about maybe with some of the stuff you're doing at Kingston with with Bushra and Mary uh this year and last year um and because maybe that's what you're and going to do. And you. And me. You're and me. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, in, the, and the institutional barriers. I mean that that's yeah. yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. So so I'm also going to embarrassed here, here but Bushra is somewhere in the crowd and I have to say I don't you know the research is I don't do it alone and you know I want to acknowledge that hey <laughs> um, but for, for us the the kind of research really started is um um I'd say before before um we met I you know I, I've had uh you know black friends in architecture uh non-white friends in architecture, but there was never really a moment where I felt like I could share um, or relate to somebody else what it's what it maybe felt like to be sort of split in half as a as a as a person. Um, in that um, I was born and raised in Ghana until I was 10 and then I moved here. So I've spent more of my life here than I have in Ghana. But there's this kind of and I think that um, as I've grown older, I'm very grateful for the 10 years spent in Ghana because I felt like they are kind of really, they're my grounding in who I am. I have less, perhaps less anxiety about my race and background because I, I think like she said, I grew up conditioned to be around black people and people that look like me. So I'm very aware that they are thousands of me. Um, when people say things like, oh, your name's Nana, it's very unique. I'm like, yeah, me and 2 million other Guyanians. Um, so <laughs> those kind of, confidence in who you are in relations of people that you see around you but then then you come here and then that's all kind of disappears because as you said you have to you realize that architecture school makes no room for you to talk about these things so your experience of space or your experience of kind of your kind of embedded embodied experience of spaces and I think with mine and Bush's research we we're really questioning what it is and lots of people have you know there have been lots to talk about what well what is African architecture all of that and I think most of that have been steered by a kind of 
what wish to define that by aesthetics because that is easier and perhaps also more sellable to a kind of vision and the kind of um, uh, catalyzed way of thinking about architecture. But actually the African architecture is, is, is maybe rooted more in experience and community and the intangible. So it's like what you're talking about, Michael, this, the, the kind of earth buildings, which is very much the culture of, you know, the buildings are living things. They are, you know, they, you, they become a building, they, they, they are what they are, and then they, they disappear and that's okay. But in the kind of creation and in my review of this book, I wrote um, that in the kind of creation of architecture, the naming of it meant a kind of creating a hierarchy in which, um, uh, architecture related to non-European origins is at the bottom. And even in that, there's a... Yeah. It's not even architecture. Yeah. Um, and and for, for me, I guess in our research, we're really trying to question a lot of, of these things. And then being lucky enough to be able to teach it um, at Kingston, for us has been a real joy because I think it's been even more important than kind of quietly doing the research and then, you know, hurrah, you publish some research, but really getting to engage with students um, as colleagues as well in this kind of journey of uncovering, I think has been so, I've learned so much. <laughs> and, you know, I've got, it's... A, I've got a naughty question now. I've got a naughty <laughs> question because I realised that I, we're no longer teaching together. I'm now teaching with somebody else at Kingston. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're also teaching at BAA, right? So, yeah. and so is Bushra. So I'm wondering, uh, and I have my own view on this, like what happens when we don't have Mary to help us? <laughs> well, what happens when you don't have the head of school to help you arrange a trip to Ghana is yeah. that although you have arranged several trips, field trips, all of a sudden, if you want to take uh, 11 students to Ghana, you're asked all sorts of ridiculous questions that you would never face wanting to travel anywhere else. And I have to say that I think that that is a really difficult thing to kind of get, get your head around. And mm. it was exhausting, yeah. worthwhile, but definitely exhausting. And I have to question why it is so exhausting. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think yeah. that, 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 that kind of exhaustion is also part of it, that kind of wearing you down because you think, will I do this again? Yeah, and I think that's where the institution really has to uh, step up and step engage up, yeah. to to give yeah. you the to give you that support yeah. to yeah. allow you uh, to do that. Um, I think this is okay. interesting. Though. If I uh, can just quickly come in, yeah, yeah. come in, yeah, please. Because I think, especially because I think uh, I was thinking about this since Shumi made a point about sort of like making space, right, in this way of reading this book together with your students, and it makes me think a lot about. Um, also as a student at University of Sheffield, um, it's like, do we always have to, I say this as a PhD researcher, right? Do we always have to work within the institution? No. Because sometimes in a context where we have realized that the institution is not, you know, maybe particularly enthused about us, <laughs> doing yeah. various activities. Well, can, I, can I answer that? Can I answer that very quickly? Wait, oh, but I, I, want, to, I want to... But I want to... Oh, yeah. That. Okay, okay. Right. When you're done, like, I'll... It's sort of a rhetorical question in a way because it's right. like there are all of these really... Some of the most beautiful spaces are the spaces that we create outside of the university, right? Outside mm. of our various institutions. Like I'm thinking of... I think she's here, Aisha Silla, who's a third-year architecture student at the University of Sheffield. We, so I'm a PhD researcher, She's, she was, uh, is a third year. And we were like, let's just get students, let's just find all the black students in School of Architecture and let's just get together and have coffee and like know each other. Whether you're a first year, whether you're doing a March, whether you're a you know, third mm -hmm. or fourth year PhD student, because normally we're all operating and we're all very, we can be very, very isolated in our year in our studio group, but then as well, um, because we're, there aren't always spaces for us to know each other, we don't get to support each other as well as a result. Mm. Right? So that's mm. something that we started doing that I think is like a really small thing that's actually really, really important. Like let's know each other and support each other, right? But yeah. then it's also like in this, we're also quite fortunate in this era of even before the pandemic, being able to connect online with various people, right? Mm. Like I'm literally in a, in a reading group with people from, uh, somebody's in New York City, people are all over the UK, somebody's in Accra, somebody's in like Zambia, and we're reading um, Black radical 
Mm. texts. You know what I mean? We're reading Frantz Fanon, we're reading all of these things. Mm. And so it's like sometimes I think it becomes, while we're maybe we're working simultaneously, we're working at multiple levels, right? We're trying to change and create more space in the university, which is actively like yeah. Um, yeah. making us, making it quite difficult to move up, which is actively structuring our absence. This is something that um, Juliet Sachianza has talked about. Um, like we're also for our own almost like survival and thrival right like we're also mm. creating spaces with each other whatever that looks like and wherever that happens to be that's also really really that's, important yeah that's actually the intention of uh dark matter university are you aware of them that's what they're doing really is that they're creating this network uh from from professors and lecturers at different universities and they've they've created this uh, university outside of the institution that's really a network and what they're starting to do now is to develop partnerships between the universities where they now uh, co-teach and are giving these lectures so it's growing and I've seen them present their work and it's it's really um, exciting it's exciting that this is happening and I think it's very much the future of university and there's yeah. again there's been a lot more motion on this um by the way michael i'm not sure if you're able to see the chat there's like quite a few comments and questions i can't i'm trying to find the you chat you might want to address <laughs> um yeah. but yeah uh again a lot more discussion about this in the us i find situations are arguably more urgent um in the academy and more imbalanced. If you look at the figures of minority architectural graduates in this country, they're pretty disgusting. But if you look at them in the States, they're really um, beyond heartbreaking. But anyway, so Dark Matter University, again, a lot of my um, friends are involved in that. The issue is still, though, that currently no one's funding that labor. And so mm -hmm. there you need to eventually hold hands with an institution. And that is, um, you know, a hurdle that one needs to negotiate. I mean, it's really fun being outside of the institution, but everything I'm doing with students from around the world is unpaid because I'm at home and I don't have a life or children. Um, so, and I can't afford either a life or children. So that's why I have time to do this. That's not right, no? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, for instance, um, my friend Esther, who uh, Esther Choi is running Office Hours. I don't know if any of you guys follow um, Arc Office Hours on Instagram, but mm. they are um, they have been a series of twenty um, POC only conversations, and they've been radically illuminating. I, I don't go to mm. all of them because the spaces are limited, and they should go to students. But um, in terms of the discussions around what's expected, what's experienced, um, and crucially, how does one get paid talking about this mm -hmm. stuff? Is it possible to evade yeah. the institution? Maybe through like, I mean, I don't think these are perfect, but there are, I don't know, there's, there's issues of credibility. I, to give a talk, yeah. I had to give a talk to our coffee, so just one second, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. I had to talk about my career and how I had gotten to that place. I was invited as a mm -hmm. POC curator of architecture to talk about um, how I got there and take questions from students. And it was uh, the most nerve wracking talk, um, maybe just after this. Um, and I had to say, I wouldn't advise, I don't want you to go through the, the sort of pain of going through institutional situations where you feel alienated and where you feel unwanted. But at the same, and that's all the things that I, I worked for free for two years. I went to, you know, all the types of institutions that we refer to as acronyms, all those sorts of things. Um, and if I hadn't done that, then they wouldn't be there listening to me. If I hadn't, mm -hmm. if I couldn't, if I didn't say, yes, I've done something at mm -hmm. Venice and yes, I've worked at Reba and yes, I've taught at the AA and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they would be there. So I felt kind of weird saying, no, you mm -hmm. don't have to engage with the institution. You can find volume. You can find important mm -hmm. things to do outside of the institution. But I did. You yeah. know, I think I think this question about the institution is really interesting. I, I, I completely earlier we were talking about exclusive and inclusive spaces. And I think that that for me, that's something I think about a lot. When people ask if um, in this uh, you know, year and people asking um, about diversity and inclusion, there's a sense that um, I felt sometimes where I'm expected to be optimistic, full of optimism about the fact that things are getting better. 
I'm not optimistic. Um, I don't think things, <laughs> I'm not optimistic. I'm optimistic when I'm in exclusive circles because I think that these kind of spaces are the spaces where I can be optimistic. But when I look back at the kind of wider um, relation as a, as, a, uh, as a black architect, I can't say I'm that optimistic, but I say that in terms of, you know, the exclusive space and inclusive spaces. I do have a kind of, um, while I think it's really in, great to formulate these ideas outside the, of the academy because all the exciting things kind of happen outside of it. But I do have a, a question that, uh, that I think goes to what you, um, Shumi and Victoria were saying about first money. And also given that we all contribute to these institutions, students through their fees and they pay the same as everyone else, why must their experience and their um, cultural heritage and learning be outside of the institution? Why must they go outside to search for the things that, um, you know, white students would get centered in their education? So in terms of this, the, I don't think that, I think that um, it's not about, um, I don't ask politely, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I don't ask politely yeah. because I think, yeah. um, you know, we are yeah. we are part of the institution, yeah. and I think that this need to 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 um, to always sort of skip, skirt around that the institution um, means that institutions can get away with this, can get away with not engaging. Yeah. So yeah, um, but to, only to a certain extent, though, right? I mean, because I mean, what you're really saying, Nana, is that it's the dark side of the moon, isn't it? That no that no one wants to acknowledge. But at the end of the day, now we have fee-paying students. I mean, there is this kind of great debate isn't, isn't there that oh we we don't have students anymore we have consumers but and it's terrible uh, mm. but this in this particular area that we're talking discussing today uh, having consumers is actually going to help us because uh, eventually you're going to have to pay attention to them to these, yeah. to these people mm. and i think that the, the first institutions to do that will be the successful ones you know in the next few years but go going back to what um victoria was saying about this question that you've all addressed do we stay in or do we do something outside? I mean, my, I, I've got a little perspective on this because I have a brother who, who had a terrible uh, experience at, at university doing something else, doing animation, but it's the same. Our, our, our experience was the same. And he's kind of been scarred for life because of it. So now he just does stuff outside mm. the world. He just mm. does his own thing. And he's like, Michael, we need to go back to Ghana. We need to blow this joint. This place is not doing it. This place is done. All right, we need to just buy the house, finish the house for mom. Let's go. Let's go. That, that's it. That, that's my brother's view, right? And I, I'm not. I'm not unsympathetic. Mm -hmm. Well, on the other hand, but on the other hand, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. On the other hand, Miles Davis, he had to go to Juilliard, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Bird had to had to study um, Stravinsky. So he maybe they didn't have to, but they they chose to, and they created a new art. Um, so. I think there's arguments for both. Um, mm -hmm. My own experience, very recent experience this year, which is what I was kind of getting at, not teaching with uh, a kind of, if you like, um, teaching partner who, who's into this sort of stuff as a matter of course, but with a great teaching partner, David Owen at Tony Fretton uh, Architects. We, we've touched on these areas. We've touched on these areas. And, and I really love the way that we have done it because it hasn't been explicit. So. Our, our theme this year has been a movie, um, The Passenger, directed by Michelangelo Antonini, which is my choice. But in that movie, the protagonist goes from uh, Chad stroke Algeria to uh, London, to Munich, to Barcelona, to the south of Spain. So, that, so our virtual field trip, which we can do because it's COVID and we can go anywhere uh, in a day, uh, we we spent every a, a different place every day uh, during the week that we used to have a field trip. We uh, I had to research that, and obviously I was given you know Saharan Africa, um, and I had to distinguish. I had to distinguish. You know, you're given Africa, but then you're saying, okay, they're in Chad, they're in Algeria. So what does that mean? That's Tuaregs, that's Tubu, that's that's nomadic people. That isn't Lagos. So I had to then come up with a kind of geography that we should be studying the Sahel really and so we were looking at the buildings of the Sahel and and, and I think Andrew Clancy our um, professor said you know that movie is going to be really risky and it, and it was risky this was a reason this was one instance where it was risky 
because when I, I brought in one of Mary's former students who is a, a, of Tuareg origin, and she said, well, Tuaregs don't like buildings, so how are you going to build for them? Mm-hmm. So they like to be out in the open. <laughs> and it was wonderful. It was, it was fantastic. For me, it's like the best thing ever because uh, one of our um, critics yesterday, uh, earlier this week, who, uh, who is a film producer actually now, uh, Robin Minotti, let's see if he's, if he's here. Mm-hmm. He said something wonderful, which I've always believed, which is architecture comes through difficulty. That's right. You have to recognize the problems that exist. Yeah. And, and for me, this isn't about kind of asking nicely, as Nana rightly says we shouldn't do, or trying to leverage space. Yeah. It's about teaching people properly. That's it. That's so it. you need to be able to teach people. Yeah. They, they need to, they need to, you need to be able to show that to the students that architecture is about producing proper solutions to the problems at hand. And if you're and, building in a Sahel. Yeah. And it's about can't. taking taking risk, yeah. Michael. So yeah. to me, it's not about avoiding risk because actually Absolutely. risk risk is where it starts to happen when you take Absolutely. risk. Nothing, happens, guys, until yeah. exactly. Nothing happens until you get there. Nothing happens until you get there. I do think um, that there is still a failure of imagination about the nature of the institutional landscape of architecture that seems immutable and monolithic, but isn't. Uh, uh, and, I do, and I do think that this conversation about uh, race and architecture, about decolonization needs to come up with a much more profound critique of not only architecture and its institutional landscape, but indeed the institutional landscape of construction more widely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that sense, I do find there, there is some, th- th- I think my criticism of the book uh, is to call it race and modern architecture, uh, because really what we need is a herald, as I, as I began by, by saying earlier, uh, of a, a, a different conception. I think that these are uh, uh, endemically, I'm coming to the conclusion that architecture and architectural history are endemically uh, and uh, epistemically um, uh, uh, racist. Um, And that what we don't want to do is replicate, you know, in a sense, I think that we don't want black architects on some level. Um, We don't want to replicate this uh, model. Um, On the other side, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is my my provocation. And I do think, because, you know, if you, in terms of what you can do with this book, uh, both um, uh, pedagogically, both in the implications, perhaps indirectly, that it may have for uh, practice, is to develop uh, an institutional critique. I don't think the abandonment of institutions is what we uh, is necessarily what we need. I mean, I I have a tortured relationship with institutions. I'm a historian of institutions. I work within them it's 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 exhausting and uh, upsetting at moments in particular in the in the context of this year but i'm yeah. still not entirely convinced that abandoning them yeah uh, or, or or even necessarily working out with them um is going to get us uh, where we uh, quite where we want to be i think as i say finding a finding a powerful uh, presenting a different vision of what uh, the production mm environment um, uh, might look like? Uh, well, um, it's, a really what, Michael, uh, it's a really good question from Aisha that I think we should... Okay, yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just about to, actually, I was going to ask if I might read out a couple of the questions. I know Michael is going to take them, but if I might read yeah. out a couple of the questions. Yeah, go for it. We have, like, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. So um, Aisha's question is quite direct. Um, so I'll ask that one, and then I might read out a few more. So if anyone listening has any more, pop them in the chat and I'll read them out to Michael. But this one is, um, what do you see? And I guess to the whole panel. Actually, Aisha, do you want to unmute yourself? Do you want to ask yourself? Yeah, that would be great. I think you can. You don't have to, though. I can read it out for you if you'd rather not. Um, Well, the question is, what do you see as being the main barriers to actively addressing econ- in these inequalities in architecture. I'm not sure which these. Are you there, Aisha? Can't hear you. There. Great to hear from Aisha. Um, so, so what do you see as being the main barriers to actively addressing inequalities in architecture? She, she goes on, I believe that people have become okay with addressing the topic in small pockets of discussions. 
Um, we can now. Yes, we can yes, now. yes, we can. Yes, yes. Anyone? Oh, yeah. Go for it, Aisha. I think I might just leave and go back. I'm not sure what the issue is. <laughs> I can hear you, so you can ask. So. It's all right. I think just, just in the interest of time, what do we see as being the main barriers to actively addressing inequalities? Apart from discussing what it is that the REBA or other institutions, what is it, sorry, what is it that the REBA or other institutions are actually doing to actively tackle racial inequalities in terms of architectural education? How do we go about putting this change in action? And I think there's a follow-up uh, follow kind of point <laughs> being made by Shawnee Tan saying, if the first steps are teaching architectural history, kind of what next? Do we have to wait for the current generation to grow up before we can see change? So I guess um, those are kind of two related questions. What can actually mm -hmm. be done? It tends to come up in conversations like this, but what can we do? And yeah. then um, another question is, do we have to wait for a whole generational shift before things can actually be done? Well, we don't have a post-colonial uh, we don't have a post-colonial history of the architectural profession. Uh, we don't, I, don't, I don't feel we really understand the ways in which, for instance, the Institute of British Architects, when it was formed in 1834, um, was implicated in the uh, colonial project. We don't even really understand about uh, how the Institute of British Architects, later the Royal Institute of British Architects, essentially a metropolitan club, uh, from the 1880s and 1890s actively began to federate with uh, architectural um, uh, uh, societies, provincial societies. The reason for this, again, is epistemological. It's that architectural history, like the discipline of architecture, is fixated with its monuments uh, um, uh, uh, rather than, or historically has been. And I think that comes out, I must say, I think that comes out really nicely uh, in, the, in the essay, Drawing the Colour Line, about a about Mumford's uh, mm. uh, almost willful blindness um, to precisely these sorts of points. So I think we first of all need um, to build on this book with, uh, I think, a, a taking the model of books like, uh, you know, Nick Beach and Katie Lloyd Thomas's edited volume Industries of Architecture, looking at the sorts of things that Linda Clark and Christine Wall have been doing at the Centre for the Production of the Built Environment at Westminster, and coming up with a much richer um, history of the discipline, and then a and then a history of the built environment, m more broadly conceived. Uh, I think, and then and then the other thing I would say is I do I do think that the, that we need to have a much more um, honest conversation within architectural culture about um, uh, protection of title. Uh, you know, the long held dream but failed project of protection of function. Uh, about uh, the way in which the internecine nature of the construction industry, the way in which it structurally fails people of color, CF Grenfell, you know, and come up with a much more compelling, um, uh, as I say, critique and um, uh, a plan for what a, a better decolonized uh, construction industry would look like, and then seek protections from the state accordingly. But it ain't gonna be bumping up protection of title to protection of function, for instance. It's just, it's just a waste of time. Anyone else on what can be done and or what are the barriers? I think those were the two parts of the question. I'll, I'll say something if uh, nobody wants to. Um, There's a bunch more questions also, so. Sure, I mean, uh, I think I'm not sure I would agree 100% with what you said, Neil. But I, I take the point. I I think that I would I would ask answer what you said with other questions. Is is the relationship of the discipline of architecture uh, with empire and colonialism is it is it unique in ter in terms of is it different to the relationships of other disciplines to to empire and colonialism? I, I'm not a historian, but I would suggest probably not. I would suggest that there's a kind of there's a kind of uh, repeated pattern to these things. Um, so I think that uh, actually that the book was a first necessary step. I think that the book, a book called Race and Modern Architecture was a necessary first step. I, I, I would say that 
from my part. Also, I don't know if anybody's heard of a professor at Brown University called Anthony Bogues, uh, who is now engaged in a project called Black Critique. And what he's doing, he's going back over all the histories that are kind of commonly taught. Um, I mean, the one of the one of the interesting ones he's looking at is the uh, kind of history of Dutch plantations, and looking at it from the, the 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 point of view of a black historian, because that's basically all you can do. Um, and giving his view, he's saying things like, for example, the Industrial Revolution didn't start in Manchester in the in the nineteenth century; it started in the colonies, in, in uh, you know, two hundred years earlier. That that kind of um, in that kind of a contribution, I think, I think goes some way to um, uh, addressing some of the issues raised by that question. I wonder if, I don't know, Aisha, if you want to come back on this with like, feel free to use the chat box, but it feels like in the questions, there was a little bit more urgency um, than what we've, than what we've addressed. So we've, I guess we've kind of been talking about different histories that need to be taught and that need to be acknowledged and i think neil certainly alluded to like connections with the profession the industry and the related industries of construction um but i wonder if and i'm not like getting at any of the panel i'm just sort of saying that there seems to be an urgency in the question of what is actually being done by institutions and yeah. i might kind of come back well we're not we're not institutions though are we? no I mean, but i can speak to i can i can speak from the perspective of one that i work for yeah. So, okay. like, in terms of, I can, I can speak to to viruses. Well, well, Mary, why don't you go ahead? Because I'm like kind of dancing around. Well, I can I can say that that um, it, they're not ready in a way. I think you know I'm 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 hitting against walls all the time, and and it's um, I almost feel like institutions at the moment are going the opposite direction, and it's it's coming out of fear of the economy with the pandemic, right? So there's this real fear. And, and the rather than actually recognizing that the problem is with whiteness and white, you know, the, the sort of white power, so looking at ourselves, it, the, the, the focus continues to be on how can we help our staff who are non-white? How can we help our students who are non-white? And for me, that's the wrong direction. You know, it's it's they don't. It's not about needing help. It's about providing a space for thinking. It's about providing a space for contributing. And but the attitude is always, what can we do to assist, right? So almost take by the hand, so that you can do things our way. Yeah. So you can catch up with our way. I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? This, this is, is fundamentally the problem in the institution. And, and I, I don't see it getting better right now. I don't see any real effort to change that. As long as the terms BAME exist, <laughs> it's not changing, right? Because that to me is fundamentally the elephant in the room. It's the, it's the thing that's, that's not helping the situation at all, but I don't see that changing. So I think there's, there is an issue and I think in the end, we have to kind of recognize that at the same time, the institution are made out of people and we are part of those people. And so we have a responsibility as part of the institution and we can try to do everything we can, but the structure of the institution is top down, right? It's like, it starts at the very top with the vice chancellor and then it goes down in this kind of, and we, you know, the teachers are at the bottom Right. Mm. But, but, but I think that, that you're talking about educational institutions. If you take the instance of a professional yeah. association like the RIBA, you know, right. nobody seriously exploits the fact that the RIBA has absolutely no statutory role. Uh, <laughs> make another one. I mean, I, 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 why this seems to elude um, um, the architectural profession, I say this as a layman. Um, in the sense, never ceases to amaze. If we don't it is think frustrating, that... isn't it, as a as a lay woman? Or <laughs> yes. Can I, I just add Bruno... something quick? Not... Sorry, please. Um, but I think uh, Bruno Silvestri, who's our colleague at, at Kingston, he's actually he's here. Hi, Bruno, and I think he wants to ask a question after. So okay. there's there's a few lined up from students, so I want to fit them in. Maybe oh, okay, we can yeah. take a few. Maybe we can take a few at a time and. Um, address them as, as we see fit. Yeah, oh, yeah hi, go huh? for it. 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to quickly go on from what Mary said about institutions not being ready, because that is something I think, I don't know if I'd completely agree with that in the sense that there are many different forms of discrimination that we can outline within institutions and within society itself. So when I see institutions like readily standing up to kind of tackle issues to do with physical disabilities, to do with feminism, to do with um, other forms of discrimination, for example, it's like, why are you so actively ready to address those ones and not ones when it comes to dealing with um, racism? Mm -hmm. So if within um, the Sheffield School of Architecture, for example, feminism is something that is heavily discussed a lot. And probably since I was in my first year, I'm in my third year now, and it's only this year that I'm finding out that there actually is an EDI committee that is meant to tackle um, these intersectional issues, especially racism. But it's like, why is that attention not given to other um, groups, especially one like this, that I think, especially this summer has kind of showed how important it is, has pressed and shed a lot of light on it, but still nothing is being done. It's always, let's talk about it. And like me and Victoria were talking earlier, and they think that talking about it is kind of solving it, or that's something that they've done a lot already by talking about it, that makes sense. The issue is, the issue is kind of, I think, somewhat related to modernism or modernity in a way, and that the things that are being done are metric like um, the kind of scrutiny that I get as an academic is how well my students are attaining grades and what yeah. I might do to supplement that. So totally what Mary's saying, rather That's than awesome. altering the framework of what we do, it's about it's about things that are measurable. And that's why those things um, tend to get higher up at the list because they're more pleasing and less messy than untangling like and addressing systemic change. Sorry, just to Can I, can I just in... say about Aisha's point though, I, I don't think it's a, perhaps not necessarily a question of what's, high, you know, and I agree, there are things that are sort of low hanging fruit that people, you know, you can tick off very quickly. But I think perhaps I'm wrong and do correct me if I am, but what I'm sensing from your question is really a quite straightforward one. Why are some inequalities more easy to get our heads around than um, racism? So this summer, for instance, you know, after George Floyd's death and all the conversations about racism and how it's structural and affects your lives, you know, there were circles that doubted how true that is. But then take the A-level grades scandal, for instance. Everyone seems to understand how that structural unfairness baked into a system could affect people's lives. So why is it so hard then, I'd have to ask, for it to understand from the same point of view of understanding how structural injustices affect other lives? Yeah. It, for me, that, that's a, it's a simple question I, I really want some answers to <laughs> because it feels kind of the elephant in the room. We can understand how other forms of injustices operate and how we deal with them. But as soon as it comes to especially anti-black racism specifically, there's a kind of sense that it's subjective. You've either made it up, you've experienced it kind of in isolation and nothing is, is true. And that subjectivity of it means that it's easily ignored. And I always, that's something that um, I think Aisha is asking a very straightforward question mm -hmm. that I don't mm -hmm. think maybe we have time to answer now, but I think it's something we all need to start really grappling with. If I could just come in on that on that one point there, just very quickly, because right at the beginning of my presentation, Nana, I, I talked about this idea that the, the subjectivities of people of colour is is ignored, that the subjectivities of, of white people is treated as object, objectivity. I mean, the, 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 the epistemological reality, actually, is that everything is subjectivity. Objectivity is a kind of myth. You know, every, every, you know, there's this kind of idea about history that uh, Wittgenstein has, which I like, which he says the event happened in the past and it's there. And then you have your interpretation of it and they sit side by side. They don't affect each other. And the idea, and this is why I like about what, Ant what Dr. Uh, Professor Anthony Bowles is doing. He's just going back and providing an additional story, just going back to what you were saying before, uh, Mary, about that these are stories, you yeah. know, so. If I could just say one thing, I'll literally be 20 seconds for okay. me. And <laughs> someone, yeah, I'm, I'm recognizing my position as someone who's coming from the US and so I don't always fully understand, you know, UK culture. But for me, I see it as a question of representation. And this is not to say that it's as simple as representation. It's to say, if we look at, you know, Aisha, your year, right? 
it's maybe like the, the, the percentage of black people is like what, 1%, 2%, right? The question of the, 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 the proportion of women is gonna be something like 50%, right? So to me, it's always a question of like, is this my problem or not? Like I fundamentally just, I often think that people don't see it as their problem. Like, yeah, that's really bad, but that's not my mm -hmm. problem, right? Mm -hmm. Thank but you, Victoria. I feel like you're getting the, to the answers. But in the case of <laughs> But in the case of Kingston, where we have more than 50% students of color who are then, you know, non-white students who are then lumped together and called BAME students, and the whole structure of, of the, the database that's being collected to, to study the achievement of these students is split in these two elements, white students and then others. And the, the attainment gap is this constant you know, trying to close that gap between that achievement, but not actually addressing or giving voice. It's really about what can we do to support the BAME students to get to the level of the white students. Yeah, That's just as you said, it's a problem of, as soon as it's being framed as an attainment gap, we're not actually addressing the issue, exactly. right? Where it's, it becomes about, and I think this connects to something that Neil had said earlier, it's like, it's not actually about changing the structure, it's just getting people to get into the structure, right? So it's just, I, mm -hmm. I think I, I connect with this mm -hmm. to what Neil was saying in terms of using the term architecture and calling ourselves architects. Like, do we actually want black architects or do we need to just mm -hmm. radically change to something else, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bunch of people wishing to contribute. There's a question from- Bruno? <laughs> and sorry, just because we had Bruno um, lined up as well. Oh okay. yeah, thank you very, Bruno, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to dispute a little bit of my uh, boss, Mary, uh, who, who was, um, which I, I totally agree with the points that you were making, and this was about five, ten minutes ago, that the institutions are not ready, and I think you're right, the institutions are not ready in these uh, top-down structures. And, and I think there are two aspects to it. I mean, since Mary joined the department, I have come a long way myself. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Um, but I've come a long way myself to develop a, an understanding of the of, of the issue, uh, and and I think Mary helped us a lot in in building the understanding of of formulating the problem, which is kind of the first step. Is trying to to understand it, and and I think Mary is right in outlining the 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 wrong way in which these things have been framed. I mean, one of my first shocks when I first arrived in England was when I fill in a form in a public service, I need to tell um, what ethnicity I am, which is something that I was not um, kind of uh, other white um, I had to fill. But what I was going to say was the institutions may not be ready, but I think there are parts of the institutions that may be precisely because of people like you. And, and I think you know, uh, cultures and, and habits are things that are very slow to evolve. And, and I think, you know, these are very slow changes, which Mary, in the last three years, you've been trying to implement. And I think the direction of travel seems to me like going in the right direction in our department. But I think when, when a revolution happens, always comes from the ground. And I think if the institutions are top down, we need to, we need to instigate these things bottom up. And I think I wish that more of these discussions and more of these dialogues could happen inside our institution, because I think the, the collective understanding of the issue at hand, I think, is, is slowly developing um, in, within, within the department as a team. And, and I think I just want to recognize that the, the, maybe there is a bit of that institution that is ready because of the work that you have been doing. And that was my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so I'm sorry, I missed the end of that because I had to run to the bathroom. <laughs> this event's running long and um, just wanted to say thanks to everyone who's still sticking here because I'm maybe making it a bit longer by reading out some more of the chat Everybody's questions. happy to stay, I think. If anybody yeah. isn't, then uh, they can let well, us know. Well, you know, they can, they can not. Um, so there was a question, just moving away from architecture and education for a second, and I think we'll come back to it because there are more questions coming in. Um, 
Deepak Banchel had a question. Is it possible for architecture to have an inbuilt, almost replicating, colonizing power? Mm. Right? <laughs> What, what do we think? Architecture as a architecture as a phenomenon yeah. is about colonizing. Is that just a big fat yes from the panel? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. from, from <laughs> me. For me, it's a yes, but it's perhaps more nuanced than perhaps I started. Forgive me, that was jokingly. When you go into it, architecture, has to erase or to um, take over space to make itself. So, in essence, it is a colonizing force. Yeah. How it can be manifested can be a can uh, be positively, positively done. Um, and I think we are now at the, at the age where it's becoming essential. So for instance, you know, there's lots of um, things being done, like, you know, the GLA's requirements for, um, for social um, regeneration projects to have agreement from the um, local, um, the local residents. That is about stopping that kind of colonizing um, way that architecture imposes itself onto places and really kind of bringing um, people that matter, they live there into the, into the buildings. However, having said that, this is why books like this are important about the institution and this wanting to bring people along rather than actually change something. This is where the links between education and profession become really evident because there is perhaps a fear of mine that we are just, this kind of thing is just about almost re-educating people into what we think they should accept as good architecture without really necessarily engaging with, with what they feel architecture is, which would make it less colonizing. But, but architecture is also, I mean, is, is not necessarily at the center of things. Yeah, uh, but we don't recognize those architects. Yeah, yeah. But, but, okay, but, but I... I Architecture is, yes, exactly. Architecture <laughs> is a service and architecture is highly susceptible um, um, to uh, uh, being abused, uh, uh, used or abused in this way. So I would, I would, I would make that point. I mean, part of the, the, for those, if anybody here happened to catch the talk that I gave to the RIBA about, which ended with a, a long section on empire timbers, it simply served to make the point that in this case, Architecture's deployment of empire timbers on certain building projects in the UK and elsewhere in the early 20th century had really very little to do with what architects wanted to do. Uh, it was part of, an, of, a, of a global system of imperial forestry at the top level uh, uh, and imperial eco-development. Then it was really about build, building uh, the, the power, a growing power of building uh, uh, materials manufacturer and then somewhere way 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 down at the bottom did it come to a decision that an architect might make uh, uh, based on a brief ultimately from a client and so again I think maybe my issue with my, my sort of fundamental issue with the premise of the book uh, is that it's, it, it centralizes architecture Though it though it draws on other forms of, of material, it draws on ideas of the user, it, it situates it in relation to orthography, in relation to manumittance of slavery, of slaves and so on and so forth, it still perhaps too strongly centers architecture. And indeed architecture at this expense of, for instance, engineering, of surveying, let alone of building. Yeah, um, I would just say for my my kind of research interest that the architecture, you need, you need money to build buildings. Mm -hmm. So you need capital to build buildings. So, so architecture has this very uncomfortable relationship with uh, the means of production. And this is something that, um, I mean, uniquely, almost uniquely among kind of, kind of arts, if, if you like. But uh, this is something that, that, that the Marxist historian uh, Manfredo Tefuri talked about. And it's the reason why he became a historian rather than a practicing architect, because he couldn't see any way of practicing architecture uh, which kind of uh, avoided that relationship. One, one thing, one possibility he did kind of allude to, which I've been looking at recently, is what happened in the Soviet Union uh, under Khrushchev and Brezhnev, whereby, okay, there was a massive, massive housing uh, program. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but there was a massive housing program, but it wasn't authorship, architectural authorship wasn't central to it. It was a kind of technical bureaucratic uh, enterprise uh, which had had to had to actually because of the kind of cultural situation, it had to actually bow down, if you like, to to people's needs and cultural um, 
and cultural uh, idiosyncrasies to some extent. Um, and so he, he looked at that as a kind of possible possible way of, of uh, um, approaching the subject. I think one of, one of the questions, uh, Michael, I think you went, I don't know that you asked it tonight, but you had considered um, was what's missing in the book. Yeah. And one of the things that's been, that I've been um, thinking about is, is a philosophy that comes out of America, very much influenced by uh, the English and German uh, romanticist movement, which is the transcendentalist movement, very influential to modern architecture. Uh, emerged emerged in the early 19th century, uh, and and you know Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, to name them, were all very. They, Louis Sullivan was a transcendentalist, and this so this idea of the individual's um, subjectivity and also transcendence, right? I think has mm. done serious damage to architecture actually. So this idea of the architect being this uh, individual who is the chief architect, the artist, right? The, the individual who's created this amazing building. And we still do that today with the star mm. architects. And we know, we all know that it's not one person who's doing this. But I think yeah. it's one of the biggest damages that has maintained that the white supremacist position, right? In architecture specifically. Um, and and it, we don't seem to be able to let that go, you know? And it's the thing that I struggled the most when I left Africa and moved into this culture where mm. it was all about the individual. And, and I was so used to always being a part of a collective, part of a community. Um, and, and architecture, what attracted me to architecture was the collective, the community. That's why I was interested in architecture because actually I started as a fine artist. My family is full of artists. I come from a line of artists. And so I started in fine arts in the US and what I realized was that in the US as an artist, in the 80s that was when I was starting, that the more weird and individual and eccentric you were, the more you were recognized as an artist. And that Just felt so uncomfortable to me that I went to architecture thinking architecture is more collective. It could be like that. I was but isn't what you said about the architect, Mary, just very quickly before yeah. it moves on, isn't that paralleled in the idea of, for example, the businessman, you know, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, sure. Jeff Bezos, uh, or even if you go back to kind of Orientalism, uh, the, these kind of people that went into these exotic places and then uh, braved the elements and braved the jungle. And it's kind of there in the mindset everywhere. It's kind of not unique to, to yeah. the discipline. Um, sorry, Nana, were you going to say something? Or, um, I don't I'm know just who... finding, um, just because it's a very, it's a very short um, book, but this little book, which you can't see because of my stupid background, oh, but it's, um, Push it there forward. we go, <laughs> there, you go. Oh, so, there we go. So it's Chinua Tebe's little oh, yeah. um, collection, um, 89p, best bit of money I ever spent. But just when we're talking about that, of what Mary's talking about, I remember this quote from it, which says, um, just let me round up with this nice little quota. Africa's people has another dimension. Africa believes in people, in the co co cooperation of, with people. If, if the philosophical dict them, dictum of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, represents a European, an, a, an European individualistic ideal, then the Bantu Declaration, and I, I won't read that because I'll do it terribly, yeah. represents an African communal aspiration. A human is a human because of other humans. Exactly. And I think that for me, that profoundly speaks to this, the way that um, these ideas that we're talking about, about individuals in society, is a profoundly European um, event, invention of individual, individualism, which then really then feeds into the kind of professions, because the professions are a European invention as well. And so to really start to understand those things, I think are the core of this, of, of some of these questions that we're asking. Yeah, there's they, something. So thank you for indulging me there. Yeah. No, that was great, man. No, no, oh, I want to actually take you up, uh, follow up on that because there's something really uh, profound about your mother tongue. And I feel blessed in a way, in many ways, that my mother tongue was a local dialect in Zimbabwe because I grew up every day how you greet someone when you say hello to someone, Waka Simbaere, 
And the answer is Daka Simba Kana Daka Simbao, which basically means, are you strong? And the answer is, I am strong if you're strong. And so already, you know, it's it's how you're communicating with each other, yeah. the language, it's embedded within the language that I only exist because you exist. Because if I'm not, if you're not well, then I'm not well. You know, so it's 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 something that is so embedded in your everyday experience that you don't even think about it until you're put in another culture where it's the opposite, where it's so completely outside of that. And that's, you know, that's where I really struggled. That's very beautiful, uh, Mary, thank you. But I just want to advocate, there's 39 of us here. Why don't we just start saying that? We could start saying that from now on, from tomorrow, instead of hello. Are you strong? I'm strong if you're strong. Let's start it and see how far it goes. Um, also, just to kind of, also just to kind of follow up on your point about um, strength and kind of the position of the artist, I just wanted to share a video um, in which David Ajay, Sarah Lewis and Theaster Gates are speaking. So uh, that's a good one in terms of positions and roles that people occupy. But we also still have a question and still have like a very patient audience. So I'm gonna hand over to Precious who had a question back to architecture and education. Um, yes, I'm gonna bring it back to architecture and education. Um, so I'm in a kind of a weird position in the fact that we've had, I'm in a school of architecture that's been advocating to decolonize their curriculum for a very long time. Um, and we're in the position where now we have like a module in the second year, which is about race and architecture, our theories of architecture. And we focus on like these really interesting theories. Like we talk about Franz Fanon um, and we have these interesting discussions, but then we get to the end of the lecture where people can start engaging and start asking questions. And we have the issue of that the only people engaging with the discussions are like the people of color in the year and everyone else will drop out of the, the call. So it's like how, and it, I mean, it's, it's definitely underlined by an idea of like what is and isn't important in an architecture. Like no one's going to drop out of a lecture about Le Corbusier, um, but when it comes to France, not <laughs> the environment. Why? They should. <laughs> I know. Um, but kind of my question is, how do we practically dismantle the idea of like, Western theories of like what is good architecture, what is important discussions in an academic sense when the academics are doing the work to bring it to us, but because we're so used to, well not used to, but we've been taught what is and isn't good or what is and isn't important, how do we, how do we dismantle that so people are actually engaging in the conversations that have been brought to them? Well, it's a difficult question because and, and the, the whole uh, sort of uh, idea of decolonization in relation to uh, in, in, in relation to hybridity, for instance, I think is is difficult uh, about mixed heritage, which I think often gets left out of that conversation. We are increasingly mixed up in all mm -hmm. manner of ways, and we have uh, ambivalences and there are ambiguities to our identities. Um, maybe that m makes me sound um, deeply conservative. I hope it doesn't because I, I'm interested in having the conversation. Um, but um, I wonder to what extent, again, what, what, we, what we want to do is, is not necessarily present this, this quote unquote threat of the removal of of the of the west or and western conceptions of thinking about for instance architecture for me me personally i find that very i find that very difficult to conceive of though i'm of mixed heritage i'm i'm a british citizen and i've lived here all of my life so i i don't know i don't i don't know what you think but i i i think what we're trying to do is engage um people in the whole conversation um, I will say, I don't think I was trying to promote a removal of the West. Like, I think mm. it's important. Well, can I, can I yeah. come in there? Um, no, sorry to, didn't mean to do that. But what I wanted to say was, I was being, I mean, this kind of, this point that you've made, it's kind of been there in a, in a couple of discussions over the last few minutes. And I've been thinking about the studio in schools of architecture, because I think that's where, for me, a, a quick answer is, because it, it, 
to solve architectural problems, you can't just always be relying on Alba or Caesar. It just doesn't work. If you wanna, if you wanna do housing in uh, in uh, uh, Sahara and in, in in the Sahel, like we're doing in, in in our third year studio this year, you have to look at other references. You have to find other ways of understanding. You have to understand the people that are there first and foremost, because they're the people you're building for. So I, I don't know if you were here earlier, Precious, but I was talking about this issue we've got in our studio this year where we're trying to make an architectural project. We've got some students who are make, making an architectural project for the Tuareg in the Sahel. And we had a we had a, a Tuareg student who is advising us on this, and she told us, my people do not like buildings. So we have to solve this problem. We can't ignore, we can't ignore it and say, yeah, well, uh, uh, you know, something like Le Leque Palmaris would look uh, uh, sexy in, 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 the, in the desert. It's just, it's, if we accept that as tutors, then that's wrong. We need to be encouraging our, our, we need to be teaching properly. This is where I really, this is what I really think is, is the issue. Um, and in the, in the studio, it's not optional. We shouldn't be making it optional. We should be critiquing students. I have a student actually, who wanted to put a Roman amphitheater in, in the desert for the Tuareg. And I've just sent him an, uh, an email today saying, look, um, it looks nice, but you can't do that. It's not, that's not gonna work architecturally. Now I know I have some colleagues who might be saying, well, yeah, it looks nice. So just give the guy a break, but well, I'm not gonna give the guy a break because I want to teach him properly. So that's where I, I come from on that. It's also about teaching the students to be more critical. And I think yeah. because we don't have the answers to everything, but, yeah. but when you empower the student to be critical, it's, it's what you're empowering them to do is to ask the right questions and to, to be curious and to want to know more and, and just guide them on, on where they can find some of the answers they're looking for. This is another problem though, Mary, this idea that we're supposed to know everything. Every practicing architect knows that you can't know everything. And in fact, if you're gonna do your part three and you go in there in, in, the, in the interview and you act like you are a know it all, you will fail because they know it's dangerous. You have to be a person who has some trepidation, who has a kind of cautionary attitude. So, you know, I didn't know we were gonna end up in the Sahel trying to design a building for people that don't want one. And I don't have the answer, so I had to bring in, you know, your former student. I've had to try and find resources because I don't know. But that's the beauty of it. That's that like you were saying good. earlier. That's where the risk is. That's the beauty yeah, of it. That will just talk about that. Mm. No, just, um, uh, I, I don't know about other uh, panelists, but I certainly am uh, starting to flag after all day teaching on Zoom. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if we might start to bring things to. A I'm conclusion. flagging. I'm flagging, but I just think we'll never get this opportunity again. <laughs> I think can I can I just say <laughs> to Precious's point that I think what I what I learned a lot um, from 2.2 last year, and also I think actually becoming more of, of a norm at Kingston, which is a real delight, is the rooms for these conversations. So I think last year when we started, and I think this cuts to a lot of what we've been talking about. I was really struck when. Um, when George Floyd was killed, um, looking at a lot of the comments and a lot of commentary and the black squares that went up. And then I saw um, a video of Toni Morrison um, interviewed by Charlie Rose. Um, and she was talking about, um, about whiteness. And she was talking about it from a point of view that if we do not, if, if you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not the job of black people to solve racism was what she was basically saying. But on that, on that basis in relation to this conversation, it's about everyone recognizing the racism or the lack of kind of criticality around architecture, race, and all these things affects everyone. Then we are in danger of never being able to talk about it holistically. Because if we only think that it affects some parts of our population, then that's a dangerous thing. And in our studio, what I really enjoyed was by working on, and I think that's also why perhaps I'm really attracted to housing, because I think that everyone has, everyone lives somewhere. So everyone has an opinion about housing. You bring your own, um, you bring something of yourself to designing housing or thinking about housing, which means that in our studio, we could have really great conversations with all our students about kind of cultural heritage, what that meant in terms of making a project in Ghana, in the way that meant that everyone could participate, no matter, we don't, we didn't have one guy named student actually, but 
all of them were able to design fantastic projects because they were able to bring a sense of their self to it and also feel that this, this conversation was necessary for them. And I think that, that maybe that's part of the issue at the moment with people, you know, you get to the end part and people log off because they don't feel a kind of buy-in into these questions. And I think that's a real shame, especially in the profession that is designing, should be designing for everyone, especially in London. It's like, I don't understand how you can operate in London without having a kind of, a, a sort of awareness of, um, of race, like the racist structures in architecture and all the things that, and the way they permeate life. So that's where you get to questions about people kind of regenerating estates without asking very fundamental questions. Some people don't care about the brick choice. They care about the fact that their life is fundamentally not going to be improved by nice windows. They live in terrible conditions. How about we start to have a conversation about that first? <laughs>